of saying hello everyone. Hi. <laughs> Let's try it again. Hello everyone. Hello. Hello. So today we're going to talk about disease mapping, about linkage and association mapping for both Mendelian and complex traits. So here we are in the population genetics and disease genomics module. We talked about the basics, the foundations of population genetics. We talked about, um, I mean, we're talking about disease associated mapping today. And then next week, we're talking about quantitative traits, EQTLs, and then heritability and systems level genetics. Here we are. Um, what we talked about already now, uh, uh, yesterday is the basics of um, what is variation in the human genome? Where does it come from? And um, what does it look like? And how do we measure it and quantify it? We looked at how uh, projects like Thousand Genomes Project and HapMap cataloged common uh, genetic variation and how we could now be ready to take this using microarrays and use it in the study of disease. So today, we're going to do exactly that. We're going to basically say, what have all of these foundational maps taught us and the ability to use them taught us about basic genetic variation uh, in the human genome. This is um, one such example of um, my own genome. This is my, my own DNA sequence. So I had a very similar slide that I, where I was showing yeast, and it's kind of cool to sort of see a genome on the screen and you kind of associate, you're like, wow, something like that runs inside me. This is actually me. This is basically my own uh, genetic material. And these are three of the worst mutations that I have in my own genome. Uh, I hope my uh, insurance is not looking at this. Um, so I have a predisposition for age-related macular degeneration, or AMD. And we actually are working on AMD right now in my lab, which is kind of cool. But the reason why I have a predisposition is because I have uh, these three common variants that I'm highlighting here. For uh, ARMS2, I have a T. For TMP3 slash TMP3, I have a C. And for C2, I have a G. And in all three cases, these increase my risk of having AMD. I also have other alleles that decrease my risk. But none of my family has as strong of a risk as I do because I inherited this specific combination that neither my mom nor my dad nor any of my siblings have. And where are these located in the genome? They're located basically in chromosome 6, 10, and 22. And you can see here the genome-wide association study that basically tells me where they are. So this is the foundational tool that we're going to be looking at today, so GWAS. And basically, uh, every one of those tells you about nucleotides that increase your risk for disease. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how do we even carry out GWAS? How do we build this Manhattan plot? And this plot is very simple. It has a dot for every SNP. So we talked about 6 million common variants. These are the common polymorphisms. So we take the 6 million variants that we talked about on Tuesday, and we plot a dot for each of them. On the x-axis, we put just simply the coordinate, the genomic coordinate of, the, of that variant along the 23 pairs of chromosome. And on the y-axis, we put the minus log 10 p-value, so the higher, the more significant, the smaller the p-value, the minus log 10 p-value of that association between that SNP and the disease, based on the chi-square statistic, being due to chance. Okay? So this basically tells you how associated are different locations of the genome with disease. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Great. So these are my own mutations. So my question is, can I do something about it? What do they mean? What pathways are affected? How do they function? What do those mutations actually do? So that's the second part of today's lecture. So basically, how do we actually interpret these genetic association studies? Sounds good? Who's excited? <laughs> good. Um, so yeah, these are the mutations. Basically, I have these bad variants. So two of these actually disrupt protein coding regions. Okay. So the ARMS2 gene and the C2 gene are directly disrupted by these mutations. And these cause amino acid changes that are then super, super bad. Um, this mutation here happens in the non-coding region. This is not inside a gene. So 
for many of the Mendelian mutations that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about um, strong effect variants, as we saw along that continuum. These are going to be the rare and strong, uh, whereas these guys are going to be the weak and common. Everybody with me? So a lot of the challenge in interpreting genome wide association studies are these guys, the ones that fall outside protein coding regions. What fraction do you think falls outside protein coding regions? Let me start with a simpler question. What fraction of the human genome codes for protein? 2%, so 1.5%, okay? What fraction of disease-associated mutations fall in protein coding genes, uh, uh, protein coding exons? Raise your hands, wild guesses. 1%. 1%? 10%? more than 50%. So when genome-wide association studies first began, we were expecting to see way more than 50% of these common variants ending up in protein coding regions. We wanted to find the gene for diabetes and the gene for obesity and the gene for, I don't know, Alzheimer's and so on and so forth. Turns out there wasn't just one gene, it was millions, not, I mean, or at least hundreds and sometimes thousands. Um, and so that's number one. Number two, um, only 7% actually fall in protein coding regions. 93% of them look like this one, okay? So that's the challenge ahead of us. And that's where the entire beginning of the term comes in. We learned about epigenomics, we learned about regulatory motifs, we learned about linking non-coding regions with their target genes. Uh, we learned about all these high C loops for finding the target genes of regulatory regions. So all of that is gonna to have to now be utilized to figure out where and when and how these mutations are acting. Which cell type, what tissue, when in development, you know, when in the environment uh, are these regions becoming active. Everybody with me? Great. So uh, in particular, this mutation here, this non-coding mutation is far away from this TMP3 gene and is actually sitting in one of the introns of this SYN3 gene. You would think that the genome is a big place, only 1% codes for protein, 1.5%. Uh, and yet, somehow, it seems to be cramming things together. It's like having a huge mansion, and you put all your toys in one tiny little box. Um, so in this particular case, there's two different genes encoded on top of each other. One is expressed this way, the other one is expressed that way. So which gene is associated with this region? Maybe neither of them. Maybe the true target sits a million nucleotides on either side. So that's what, we're going to be, that's what we're going to be studying. So basically, what are the questions for this module? We already talked about how do we catalog all genomic variation, all single nucleotide polymorphisms. That was Tuesday. How do we systematically associate them with disease? That's today. How do we use GWAS to understand disease mechanism? That's today and Tuesday. And how do we translate all of these insights into therapeutics? And that's uh, several lectures throughout the term. Okay. So how do we understand the molecular base of human disease? Well, first, we're going to talk about Mendelian traits. So basically, this is the top left quadrant in the previous plot that basically asks us um, about weak, uh, sorry, low frequency, but very strong effect variants. Then we're going to talk about genome-wide association studies. This is the bottom right quadrant. These are the uh, <clears throat> very common, but very weak effects. And then we're going to talk about interpretation of how do we study individual loci and how do we study global signals by aggregating many loci. And very often the two are linked because you can use these global signals to infer some recurrent patterns, which you can then go back and apply to the individual loci. And then lastly, we're going to be talking about sort of where's the field heading with exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, and medical sequencing. Sounds good? All right. So let's talk about Mendelian traits and versus complex traits and so on and so forth. So I mentioned Mendel last time. So Mendel basically was the first person to recognize that there are discrete units of inheritance and that variation in these units was transmissible and resulted in phenotypic differences. This is pretty dramatic. So he basically looked at combinations of traits using these uh, squares. And then he basically said, depending on which allele I inherit uh, for a pair of loci, so for example, uh, you know, round and yellow uh, or, um, sorry, 
round versus not round and yellow versus uh, green. Okay, so basically, depending on the combination of alleles you had, the progeny would be dictated, and then the fractions that he was finding. Of course, he didn't know which alleles were inherited where, but he could count the fractions of phenotypes, and then from that, he inferred his rules of genetics, basically independent assortment, which is always true except for uh, when things are linked, which is a major tool for mapping resilient traits, and then the fact that um, units are discrete. Okay? So that's the first part, basically understanding inheritance. Number two, uh, the fact that some pairs of phenotypes were not passed on independently, therefore violating Mendel's second rule. If you look at the, the uh, frequencies that you would have expected, you would have expected, I don't know, maybe sometimes 25%, 25%, 25% if it was independent assortment. But if something is super closely linked, you either get both or none at all. Okay. And that deviation basically tells you that these regions are sitting right next to each other on the chromosome. Everybody with me so far? So you can measure not just some approximate distance, you can measure exact genetic distance, which very frequently correlates with genomic distance, but more directly it correlates with the frequency of recombination between those two events. And we talked about PRDM9 and its tragic love story with this motif. So genes on the same chromosome are passed on in tandem unless meiotic crossover comes in. Uh, and then if the genes of interest are, are uh, separated by about three centimorgans, this is how you measure genetic distance. And three centimorgans simply means 3% chance of recombination, okay? So if you found 50, 50, 0, 0, they would be on top of each other. If you found 25, 25, 25, 25, they would be on different chromosomes. And if you found uh, you know, 48.6 with about 3%, um, you know, uh, separation. That basically means that for 3% of the progeny, there was a breakpoint. You can actually directly translate that into 3 centimorgan uh, distance. Everybody with me? And those distances are additive. They're actual distances. So that's how uh, the linear uh, order of chromosomes was first uh, recognized. Again, this is a quote directly by Alfred Sturtevant, the study of Morgan, the, the student of Morgan, who basically says, I suddenly realized that the variations in strength of linkage uh, uh, already attributed by Morgan to differences in the spatial separation of genes offered the possibility of determining sequencing, like or the ordering in the linear dimension of the chromosome. I went home and spent most of the night, the neglect of my undergrad homework, mm -hmm. in producing the first chromosome map which included the sex linked genes, Y, W, V, M, and R, in the order and approximately the same relative spacing that they still appear on the standard maps. This is kind of cool, right? The answer is, if you guys need to turn in your homework late and you're gonna revolutionize genetics, be our guest. <laughs> we will accept it. And then he was able to suddenly map all of these genes in the right order and orientation. Right? You basically have all these pairwise distances and you're like, well, if I put this one here, I can draw a circle, put that one there, I can draw another circle, and wherever these circles intersect the line, I can actually infer the order of these uh, genes. And that's where Mendelian genetic trait mapping comes in. So Mendelian diseases travel predictably and consistently in families. You can basically have you know, the combination of alleles of the parents being passed on to large progeny according to the laws of Mendel, um, except for, of course, when some of these mutations are lethal. And then you can use this co-segregation of nearby traits using markers along the chromosome to basically map genetic disorders to the loci that govern them in the case of Mendelian genetics. So there's thousands of diseases and traits that are caused by mutations in a single gene. For example, Huntington's, cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, and so on and so forth. And those have been mapped to specific locations this way. So for example, if you have some marker that you can place along the chromosome, and then you find that this marker co-segregates with this particular disease phenotype with some, I don't know, 4% recombination, then you know that it is four centimorgans away. Everybody with me? So basically, you can track the co-segregation of DNA polymorphisms with disease statues, and that, that permits identification of the regions containing responsible genes and mutations. And this was dramatically successful. So hundreds of uh, disorders have been mapped that way. 
So linkage analysis and positional cloning are very powerful because genetic risk factors are highly penetrant. That's a very key concept. So the concept of penetrance basically says if I have a mutation, how likely am I to also have the disease? And in the case of Mendelian disorder, penetrance is super, super high. Everybody clear with the concept of penetrance? Question. Is there any like nice Mm -hmm. But it depends on the frequency of recombination in species. So, you know, about a megabase for some species, but it varies. Everybody with me on penetrance? Penetrance is a hugely important concept because you can basically ask, what are all of the modulators that alter that arrow? And if there's many modulators, penetrance will be lower. You will have less predictability between the genetic variation and the disease. So that's from Mendelian traits. That's where basically a single gene guides the phenotype, <clears throat> and then we can map it using these approaches. And you can see here two different axes. One was the progress of Mendelian trait mapping. And you can see these much more generous hundreds of traits. And then here you can basically see the number of complex trait genes. And they're off by, uh, you know, more than an order of magnitude, okay? You can basically see here that we've mapped um, 1,600 traits through Mendelian genetics and <clears throat> 10 through um, GWAS, okay? So a lot of people basically started saying, oh, GWAS will, GWAS will never work. There's just, you know, you guys are wasting your time with these common variants. And um, there was also a lot of pushback on complex traits, even against Mendel. And Mendel himself, frankly, doubted his own theory. So you basically had the biometricians who were looking at this natural variation, and Mendel was basically saying, well, my theory kind of works for peas, but it doesn't seem to be working for humans. And, and that, that puzzled him, and that basically made that throughout his lifetime, his theory was never recognized as a breakthrough because people thought it would apply to very rare uh, occasions. Until uh, the early 1900s, where um, complex traits started getting mapped in the same way with multiple genes underlying this. And then polygenicity was finally embraced statistically as a thing where it wouldn't be just one genetic variant leading to disease, but it would be hundreds and possibly thousands of genetic variants each affecting to a small degree various intermediate phenotypes and all together contributing to a disease state. Okay, so this is fundamentally different from this giant arrow between one genetic mutation and disease in the Mendelian case. Everybody with me? And that's just a genetic component. In addition, you have many environmental and um, sort of other exposures that also affect both your uh, the functioning of all these genes and the expression of all these genes and ultimately the disease phenotype directly. Sounds good? So this is basically from 1975, well, well before we had the ability to carry out uh, genome-wide association studies um, of basically suggesting that these mutations would not be affecting the gene function on or off, but instead would be subtly changing the expression of those genes. And this is something that um, was pervasive, not just in phenotypic variation, but also in evolutionary, how evolution acts on that phenotypic variation. We suggest that evolutionary changes in anatomy and way of life are more often based on changes in the mechanisms controlling the expression of genes than on sequence changes in proteins. We therefore propose that regulatory mutations account for the major biological differences between humans and chimps. This is very ahead of its time because even as genome-wide association studies were being carried out, folks were still hoping to find protein coding mutations, but of course they didn't. Anyway, Ari Fisher, as I mentioned, basically wrote this very nice uh, paper, the correlation between uh, relatives on the supposition of Men Mendelian inheritance. Again, he's basically saying, all these continuous variation that you're seeing can actually be explained by Mendelian inheritance. So if you have as few as five Mendelian loci, 
the resulting distribution will actually look pretty continuous and it will be indistinguishable from you know having some kind of continuity rather than this discrete inheritance and then that's where complex traits come in so basically instead of one gene determining a disease or a trait many genes each exert a small influence none by themselves can cause or explain the disease or trait fully but together with environmental influences combined to, de to, to define an individual outcome, okay? And that's most common diseases. So, you, you know, all of the big killers in the population, like Alzheimer's and obesity and diabetes and, you know, psychiatric disorders, pretty much every common disorder uh, works this way, okay? So this is the picture of you, uh, you know, um, basically a few years ago where there were very few of these and suddenly G was exploded. Okay. So there's three different elements that turned the tide from uh, the early 2000s where there were just a handful of sites mapped with complex traits to the about 80, 120,000 that are mapped today. And these three are genome resources, technology and collaboration. Okay. The first challenge, of course, was even mapping the human genome, which was not done until, you know, officially 99 and eventually 2003. So the sequencing of the human genome basically enabled the basis for all of this. Then the cataloging of common variation, have map and a thousand genomes project didn't happen until 2008 and 2010. The second challenge was technology, sequencing genomes was extremely laborious. People would basically read off arrays and sort of speak them to a microphone or speak them to an assistant who would basically type them in from radioactive slides. It, it, it was just um, the stone ages of genome sequencing to being able to carry out millions of uh, measurements with a single array and millions of arrays, millions of arrays across millions of people. Okay. So that basically allows you to look at affected individuals and controls measure every SNP in the genome, and then basically ask uh, what is the, um, the prevalence of every SNP in cases versus controls. And then the third challenge was that because these effects are tiny, you need huge sample sizes. You basically need sometimes millions of individuals to recognize these effects. And that is not possible in a single hospital because you just don't have millions of Crohn's disease patients in the same hospital. So what you end up with is dramatic uh, collaborations across many, many different uh, hospitals across the world who are pulling together all their patients. So again, in the case of Crohn's disease and colitis or inflammatory bowel disease, you basically see these IBD genetics consortium has members and participating institutions across the world, okay? So you've now pulled all these together, you have your cases, you have your controls, and you've measured every SNP in the genome. How do you actually build this Manhattan plot? So the first thing is that you need to do some technical QC, quality control. Basically remove failed SNPs or failed SNAP samples. You want to do some genetic QC. Basically look for Mendelian segregation, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, estimate relatedness. You know, individuals are showing identity by descent or identity by state. Identity by descent basically means that they have the same uh, SNP in this location, they have the same variant in this particular polymorphic site because they are related. And if that happens, you don't want to take in, uh, into consideration the same way as you do for two unrelated individuals because you're going to be messing up your statistics. Uh, you want to check that um, you know, gender effects where basically the X or the Y chromosome or whatever is downstream of those chromosomes is not simply regulating the expressivity or the penetrance of a particular trait. And then lastly, you wanna look at population structure. So, um, I don't know, asthma is much more prevalent in Nordic countries, not because of genetics to a large extent, but because of environment. I don't know, they wash everything much more than we do in Greece. Um, so uh, kids are not exposed to as much uh, you know, um, immune uh, insults as they're young and therefore their immune system is not trained in the same way. And there's a very big correlation between 
uh, population structure, Nordic versus Southern Europeans, and environmental influences, and socioeconomic status, and so on and so forth. So there's dramatic differences that correlate with population structures, which could alone explain your association. So if you find an association that maps to one location in the genome or a few locations in the genome, that's great. But if you map to thousands of locations in the genome, you now have to ask, are those locations also correlating with Northern versus Southern ancestry? If yes, you have a problem. So you, you basically usually build principal components of your big genotype matrix, and then you ask, are my traits correlating with these principal components? Okay? So you want to ask, is, you know, and if my first principal component is Northern versus Southern European, and my second one is, I don't know, Eastern versus Western, and my third one is sort of whatever region I'm, I'm from, then I want to sort of maybe completely remove those principal components from my genotype array. Basically, I can take my genotype matrix and subtract the effect of these principal components. So for every individual, I basically have my eigenvalues and my eigenvectors are basically separated my matrix. And then I basically say for this individual, they are, I don't know, 60% Northern and 30% Western and 20%, I don't know, Bavarian or something. So I'm gonna multiply these coefficients with the eigenmatrices of contributions of each of these ancestry groups and then subtract that from the signal. It doesn't change most of the SNPs and it changes many, many SNPs by tiny little amounts. But after that tiny little amount is, re is removed, then the remaining variation is what is much more likely to be biological. Raise your hand if you're with me. Awesome. Any questions so far? All right, so that's you know the second type of QC. And the third one is analysis-based QC, where basically you're running test statistics and you ask, are they systematically inflated? Are there biases towards missing data? Are there specific allele frequencies that are sort of recurrently found? And these, you just have to look for you know things that would look like signal, but signal acting in very weird ways. Okay. And after you've done all your QC, then you do a chi-square test. You basically say, here's the number of cases, and here's the number of controls, and here's the number of people that have the A or the G allele of that particular SNP. What is the ratio that I would expect? So here, if I look at the G allele, I expect a one-to-one -one correspondence, roughly, 976 versus 932. Here, I don't see anything like the one-to-one. -one. Everybody with me here? So you basically do your chi-squared two-dimensional contingency table, and you basically ask, are these deviating from what I would, uh, I would have expected? So how do you do that? You basically do a chi-square statistic, which is basically the sum of observed minus expected squared divided by expected. Now, what is expected? Well, if I flatten out my distribution and I ask what fraction is A, what fraction is G, what fraction is K, what fraction is control, I can multiply these fractions to basically get a roughly flat table of 47, 47 is what I would have expected. Is everybody with me here? Uh, instead, I can basically measure what I observed, and then this observed minus expected square divided by expected is this, and I can just sum all that up, and what I end up with is a chi-square value of 24, okay? How do I transform that into a p-value? I basically look at my chi-square distribution and I basically say, given two degrees of freedom that I have here, I expect to see the green curve. And when I find a number which is 24.5, I go all the way out to 24.5 and then look at whatever p-value it gives me, basically whatever frequency I would find this by chance in a chi-square two-dimensional two, two contingency table. Raise your hand if you're with me. Awesome, great. And that's basically how you end up with your p-value. 7.3 times 10 to the minus 7. So basically very simple tests, single marker regression, chi-square, rule the day when it comes to genetics. Association results require arcane statistics and complex multi-marker models are actually, unfortunately, very often much less reliable. So you will be quite surprised in the field of genetics that all of these distributions are, you know, old by sometimes many decades, sometimes centuries. Um, and this, um, this is just the norm because of how careful you need to be 
because as soon as you start adding more and more variables to your model, you might capture all kinds of things that um, can lead to biases and uh, tricky signals. Everybody with me? So <clears throat> the question is, how excited should I be? Right? P value of 10 to minus 7. I don't know if you've seen this XKCD cartoon that basically says um, uh, green jelly beans have no association with cancer. Yellow jelly beans have no association with cancer. Orange jelly beans have no association with cancer. Blue jelly beans have no association with cancer. And it goes through like that through 20 different colors of jelly beans. And it says, we found a significant association of 10 to the minus 5 with, you know, purple jelly beans. <laughs> what happened we basically tested 20 different things and one out of the 20 happened to have a 10 to the minus you know 0.05 basically 5 times 10 minus 2 p value which is exactly what you would have expected by chance okay so what's the problem multiple hypothesis testing basically if i take i don't know every single color on your clothes and I ask, what is the correlation with sitting on the right side of the room? If I test enough colors, I'm going to find a p-value that's 10 to minus five, two times 10 to minus two, or five times 10 to minus two. Everybody with me here? So, what do I need to do to this nominal p-value? I need to correct it by the number of hypotheses that I've tested. How many hypotheses have I tested? Well, the question is, how many independent SNPs are there in the genome? How many independent haplotype blocks? Okay, because if a SNP is correlated with 20 other SNPs, they're not 20 different hypotheses, they're one hypothesis. And if the next block is also correlated, it's not 20 hypotheses, it's one hypothesis. Everybody with me here? So basically, we need to test what is the total number of independent SNPs or independent linkage disequilibrium blocks in the human genome. And that's what we need to correct this number by. Okay, so in uh, in the genome, we are finding roughly 1 million independent loci, okay? 1 million independent linkage equilibrium blocks. So if every study wants to achieve a significance after Bonferroni correction of 0.05, of basically being wrong only one time out of 20, so if I publish 20 studies, one of them is going to be wrong, that's okay. But basically, if I, if I report 100 SNPs at exactly this p-value, I would expect, you know, about five of them to be bogus. And that's okay. That's a number that we, we can live with. But we can't live with a number of, like, most of them being bogus because of the multiple hypothesis testing. Very often, with larger cohorts, you will see numbers that are, like, 10 to minus 73. So these are way, way above the significance. But for things that are close to that significance threshold, you should be wary. You should be, like, taking them with a grain of salt which is about one in 20, okay? Everybody with me? So basically carrying out these multiple hypotheses requires a correction by a factor of a million. And therefore in order to achieve a p-value of 0.05 after correction, we need to put a cutoff of five times 10 to minus eight, okay? That's basically 0.05 divided by a million. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome, yes. Remember the part about archaic statistics? <laughs> <laughs> it's better safe than sorry. Again, the field of GWAS suffered greatly because people would basically show up and say, oh, I didn't do a million hypothesis. I only tested my three favorite genes. This one that I published about, this one that I published about, and this one that I haven't published about. And it was that one. Why did you test the third one? Because it looked right. Turns out they had done a million tests. Something was barely nominally significant. And then they said, oh, I only tested three. And then they would publish these three. Or they would do a candidate list approach, which basically said, here's my genes. I'm going to test those. The problem is that if you then went off and tested just as many things elsewhere, you would find just as many hits. So the field of GWAS went through a replication crisis where basically the things that were barely passing significance threshold were not actually biologically real. And um, so a, a very important concept that I think it's important to recognize is, uh, and I don't know if I have a slide for this, 
is a uh, winner's uh, curse. So I don't know if you've heard about regression to the mean. Why do they call it regression? The term regression actually comes from when they were looking at fighter jet pilots and they basically would give awards to those that performed extremely well. And then they noticed that every time they gave an award to someone, they would regress to the mean. They would basically perform worse the next time around. And they basically stopped giving awards. They said, okay, <laughs> correlation equals causation. It clearly must be the awards. Uh, <laughs> standard practice. Um, so uh, it turns out that if everyone has some basic awesomeness, some people are like Maverick awesome, some people are like Goose awesome, and some people are like way down here and totally not awesome, okay? Um, everyone performs with some Gaussian distribution surrounding their average awesomeness. And every now and then, Maverick will kind of suck. And every now and then, Ma Maverick will be more awesome than he normally is. That's when he would get the award. The next time around, you would get an independent sample around his awesomeness distribution. And he would, of course, be much more likely to perform worse right after getting the award because it's another random sample. So with random sampling alone, you would explain away the data completely by basically saying, yes, there's a regression to the mean because I'm sampling from the distribution. The same exact things happen in genetics. You basically have a bunch of variants with various level of awesomeness or association, okay? Some variants are truly having an effect of 0.1%. But in the specific cohort that you measured, by the sampling biases of that set of individuals, their measured effect in that sample happens to be 0.2% in that one sample. You do all your statistics right, you then find an association that's barely above the p-value, you're like, awesome, let's record it. And then you get a different cohort, it's now at 0.5 or 0.05%, okay? And that's just a random statistical fluctuation around the true effect size of that variant. So the replication crisis in part came from the winner's curse, which basically means that when you actually win, when you barely pass that threshold, you're much more likely the next time around to be below the threshold, just because you're sampling from that underlying true awesomeness distribution. Everybody with me? Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Raise your hand if, if this like, is kind of cool and kind of makes sense. You're like, aha, this makes sense. Great, awesome, good. Um, all right, so basically uh, for linkage, this is roughly the corrected p-value after testing roughly 50 independent chromosome arms. In GWAS, you're testing roughly 1 million loci, and then the you know, uh, Bonferroni corrected p-value threshold is 5.7 minus 8. It's kind of cool because this, this number was suggested well, well, well before we knew what was actually going on and how many independent blocks there are but it has actually proven to, to, to stand the test of time um, extremely well. So this was like a back of the envelope calculation, oh, roughly a million, and it, it's actually proved to be amazingly uh, good. So in case you ever wonder where is this number coming from, you now kind of know the, the whole backstory. All right, so basically in 96, uh, Richard Mariganis proposed this p-value of 5 times 10 minus 8, which is a p-value of 0.05, corrected for a million independent tests. That's like well before we even knew how many haplotypes blocks there are in the human genome. As a conservative threshold for declaring significance to overcome this replication crisis. And in 2008, um, uh, 12 years later, you basically have three different independent groups that uh, study this empirically based on thousands of GWAS studies that have been carried out. And they come up with roughly this number, which is pretty awesome, right? So these guys are like, yeah. Um, all right. And, and basically, that's what these numbers represent. So basically, 10 to minus 8 is up there. Depending on how many SNPs you're testing, you can draw lines that are lower. You can basically say these are nominally significant down here, or genome-wide significant up there, or um, you know, above some kind of correction on your number of tests uh, here. And you can basically see that this SNP here and that SNP there are basically a 10 to minus 13 
they're very good. Even if you assume some random fluctuation, they're not going to change much, and they're much more likely to replicate. This one, eh, barely made it. And this one is much more likely to go away, but it might actually stay. And then some of these guys here might grow taller, but you know, we just need to do the test. Um, what we're trying, what we're starting to learn more and more is that even down here in the noise, there's a huge amount of signal. And basically, if you have statistical methods that allow you to extract that signal through all kinds of additional independent enrichments, like epigenomic variation, evolution conservation, etc., you can find a lot of good things down there. So we've published papers basically showing that you can select some of those lower, below threshold SNPs using additional evidence. And then when you do that, they're much more likely to validate experimentally. Okay, everybody with me? So um, again, don't believe a report of association from a single study, even with very strict quality control, there are artifacts that can affect one every thousand or 10,000 SNPs and escape notice. And strict genome-wide significance is uh, generally not exceeded dramatically. Uh, if it's reached at all in a single study, but when you combine multiple studies, you basically get to surpass it by a lot. Okay, so this is basically the you know workhorse of genome-wide association studies. This Manhattan plot that basically plots for every SNP in the genome its association based on the chi-square statistic and its location. And what you will also notice is that SNPs tend to pile up. Why do you think this happens? Remember the part about, yeah? Exactly. So these are in linkage to equilibrium with each other. So technically linked together means on the same chromosome. So, but associated or co-inherited, I think it's uh, more common. Um, so these are gonna be in linkage to equilibrium with each other. And basically if you test one, chances are the other ones will come along for the ride. But what's really interesting is that, and again, you know, here you think you're seeing individual dots, but notice how much smaller these dots are than those dots. So there are many more SNPs here uh, than, than one or even the number of dots that you see. So those don't necessarily um, represent SNPs which actually have an effect on the disease, but Correct. one of them does. Exactly, exactly. It could be that the one that does is actually down here. And because of statistical flukes, this one, was stronger. With sufficiently powered GWASs, you may be able to say that the ranking given by the genetics is in fact more likely to represent the ones that are tr truly causal. But within you know, um, some variation, you might not be able to tell. And again, as I mentioned here, there are dozens of SNPs up there, not just one. And among those dozens, you have no idea which one's the causal SNP. Everybody with me? Okay, <clears throat> and then what a QQ plot does is basically plot the uh, observed value of your chi-square statistic and your expected value of your chi-square statistic. And if you, if you find that they are aligning with each other for the vast majority of your uh, SNPs, then your study is well calibrated. If you find that even early on in this distribution, there's a bulge out here, that basically means that there's something wrong. You might have some huge population certification. You might have some huge bias in your measurement. There, there might be all kinds of artifacts that are inflating your um, statistics. But what you normally see is that for all of those low values of your chi-square statistic, before you get into the 12s and 20s and so on and so forth, are very well aligned and then you basically have this uh, huge deviation and that's where the signal actually is okay yeah so the gray is some confidence interval by sampling from a random distribution the blue is what you see in a overinflated study where you basically see that there's this deviation that sort of continues throughout and the, the black is what you see in a well-powered study where you basically have a huge number of signals that clearly uh, stand up. Basically here you have some kind of bulge but it's across the entire length and then it falls within that gray 
no confidence zone uh, for the most significant ones. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Uh, the number of samples, absolutely. Also, how clean is the measurement? What are you, what are you doing? You basically, every time you do a genome-wide sensation study, you basically ask, what is the correlation between phenotype and genotype? And if your phenotype is noisy, if it's not very well measured, you're eating up your power because there's contributors that are non-genetic that are affecting that. And therefore, your total quote unquote heritability, which we're going to talk about on Thursday next week, is reduced because the heritability is the amount of phenotypic variation divided by the amount of genotypic variation. So, if uh, that is explained by a genotype variation, so basically your heritability is uh, reduced, and therefore anything that you could possibly explain with genetics is reduced if your measurement is not accurate enough. So, basically, your power immediately depends on sample size, but on all kinds of other effects as well. Basically, if you have a cohort that's mixed between different ethnic backgrounds, for example, that could also bias your results, that could decrease your power and so on and so forth. But usually when we talk about power, we'll typically mean number of samples in a clean study. Any other questions? Yeah. Louder, please. Yeah, so it depends on the number of samples that I have, on the number of degrees of freedom that I have, and I'm sampling from the genome itself. So basically, every time I calculate one of those, I can basically generate samples, and I can sample from that. So I can basically say, if there's no signal in the genome, can I simulate SNPs and how they would vary? I mean, one way is to basically look at that chi-square distribution, and that's sort of where all these calibrations come from. The other way is to actually just simply run a simulation where you're generating cases and controls and you're sampling from those. So depending on your, the size of your cohort, you would expect to see different chi-square distributions of the actual numbers that you're drawing. Does that answer your question? Other questions? Okay, awesome. So basically, the gray is by doing a thousand samples, and then the blue is one bad study, and the black is one good study. Sounds good? And basically, when you now find a hit, for example, um, in this particular case, the IL23R uh, gene, which is this one here in red, you basically see all these dots that are on top of each other. That's because we are looking at the whole genome here. But if you spread them out, you can basically see where are those dots relative to each other. Where are the different SNPs? You can basically see here the recombination rate on the right. These are this continuous curve, which basically tells you that there's a big recombination hotspot here, and there's a smaller one here. And in between them, you see this large number of genome-wide significant hits. So this is very typical. This is exactly what you would expect. Okay. And then in some cases, all of them will be at the same height. In other cases, one of them will be, or some of them will be slightly higher. And these are more likely to be the causal ones, okay? In this particular case, it just so happens that your uh, amino acid changing SNP is in fact the one that shows the strongest genetic association. So the functional evidence, i.e. it sits inside a protein gene, seems to align with the genetic evidence, i.e. it is more strongly associated. And that basically tells you that even though these recombination spots are big, there are some smaller recombinations that are happening here. You see this wiggly line at the bottom? That basically tells you that this is, um, that, that some of these SNPs are actually separated by recombination events. And you might get lucky. In your cohort, you might have recombination events that have actually happened, where some individuals only carry half the LD block, but not the other half for that particular allele. And then you will have more power to detect the true causal SNP. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Great. So you basically see all these SNPs laid out uh, over this interval, and you can see here the association for uh, the, the causal 
So then the question is, <clears throat> great, we have these two techniques. We have genome-wide association studies and we have linkage. Do they actually agree? How often do they find the same loci? And you can see here one locus, like one of the top two loci from genome-wide association studies, was also found by linkage. The other one was not found by linkage. What is happening? Why was it not found by linkage? Basically, the Mendelian approach did not map this, but the Mendelian approach also mapped that. So what are we looking at? We're basically looking at two completely different sides of the frequency spectrum. Basically, if you have within the same gene, within the same locus, common variants and rare variants that are both impacting disease, then you would expect a strong effect variant, which is expected to be at very low frequency because evolution wouldn't let it rise to high frequency. So you would expect a strong effect variant to be found by Mendelian studies. If you have a weak effect variant, which is very, very common in the population, you would expect to see it. If you only have weak variants that are rare, you're not going to discover it by GUS. And if you only have weak effect variants, you're not going to discover it by linkage because you just simply are underpowered in the different frequency regimes. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome. So this is exactly what's happening here. Basically, for NOD2, the one that was also found by linkage, this is a low frequency, strong risk variant. For IL23R, this is a low frequency, strong protective variant. Why is protective an issue here? The problem is that Mendelian association studies are focusing on the tail end of the risk distribution. Basically, there's some natural population frequency of schizophrenia, of Alzheimer's, of Crohn's, uh, IBD, and so on and so forth. Okay, Natural frequency would basically dictate, dictate that you know, roughly one in a thousand individuals, one in a hundred individuals will have that disease. When you do a case control study, you don't go out and randomly sample people on the subway or on the street. You basically go, which would be hugely biased because six people might not be there. Uh, <laughs> um, you don't even call random numbers from the phone book. You basically go in a hospital and you find 50,000 cases in this hospital, another 50,000 in that hospital, and there are 50,000 in that hospital. Are these random samples? Of course not. They're sampling from the tail end of the distribution. You then match them with samples from healthy individuals. If something's a risk variant, yes, you're likely to also discover it by Mendelian studies because you are sampling predominantly from the risk. In this particular case, this was a protective variant, so you didn't sample in your um, cases for an overabundance of that variant. Everybody with me here? Great. Um, and then ATG16L1 is down here, and then this is a common associated variant. Though you can now look at their frequencies in the, in the population, and you can look at their effect sizes, okay, or their odds ratio. So NOT2 has three different coding SNPs over here. You can see this dot being larger. There's actually three different coding SNPs that are all associated. Its frequency is one out of 20 people. Its ratio is a threefold increased chance of the disease. And its association, uh, the, the, the number of association cases that are required to achieve genome-wide significance is only 435 because it's a frequent variant with a huge odds ratio. Who's with me so far? Awesome. The number of pedigrees that you would need based on linkage analysis to map it would be around 1,400. Basically, this is the number of families that you need to subdivide the genome sufficiently to be able to map this one locus, given an odds ratio of three. Okay? And the reason for that is that as you, for every individual in your family, they share 50% of their genome. So out of 6 million SNPs, they share 3 million of them, give or take. Okay? So 
having only two individuals and saying, okay, great, they're both affected is not really helping. It's like, oh, great, it's in, it's in the half they share. Having one more reduces that to a quarter. Having one more reduces that to an eighth. So for every family, you're basically reducing that fraction of shared versus not shared by some fraction, okay? Of course, if the odds ratio is only threefold rather than an infinite fold of basically having the disease or not having the disease, then you can't just simply split the genome in half each time, okay? So basically with a Mendelian trait, yes, it goes down exponentially, but with, um, you know, non-Mendelian where you only have a threefold effect size, it doesn't go down that fast. And that's why you need such a huge number. Everybody with me so far? So for IL-23R, this is again a protein coding alteration. You basically have a 7% frequency and an odds ratio, which is again one third. So basically this is a protective allele. And then you would need 800 uh, cases, but you need a huge number of uh, individuals for linkage analysis because it's protective. And then for ATG16L1, you basically have a 50% frequency. So uh, this is very, very common. So GWAS is well powered for that. You basically only need 1,300 independent individuals. But because its odd ratio is so small, you need a huge number of pedigrees to recognize. Okay, who feels that they're learning stuff? Yeah, good. All right, so of course, combining studies leads to greater power. Basically, if you only have one study, you have you know, uh, little power, but the more studies you, com you combine, the more power you have. And what you see is that as uh, the studies progress and more and more individuals are in included, you basically see that the number of loci is dramatically increased, okay? So here's the progression for Crohn's disease. You basically see that before GWAS, you basically had two loci that were previously identified by different consortium members. You then have, you know, uh, an additional locus after many, many years, and then you have more and more and more, and suddenly it explodes as you start increasing the number of individuals. And you see the same thing in um, uh, schizophrenia. So in schizophrenia, you have zero reported, um, uh, individual, reported kids for a while, and then you start increasing your number of individuals dramatically, and then you basically see that with 3,000 cases, you have zero loci, but something is begging to become significant. With 10,000, you basically have five loci that are, that are crossing that threshold. With 35,000, you have 62 loci. With uh, 65,000, you have 265 loci, and so on and so forth, okay? So you basically have this dramatic inflection point where you know, the moment you discover your first uh, hit, if you double or triple or, you know, uh, multiply by nine the number of cases, you basically see this dramatic inflection point in the number of loci. And the reason is that evolution is basically maintaining things at low frequency when they have a sufficiently strong effect. That basically means that anything you're going to discover is going to be just below that frequency, or should I say that frequency times effect size combination, comma effect size combination, okay? So basically, depending on the frequency and the effect size, evolution will be keeping things at low signal. Depending on how many loci there are, that total contribution to the phenotypic variation is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And for extremely polygenic traits, where evolution has basically been keeping down tens of thousands of loci to that level, you basically are going to cross that inflection point at different numbers of cases. And, but, but basically, when you cross it, you're going to have all of these things lurking just below that threshold. And that's where this inflection point comes in. Everybody with me so far? So that's sort of the key, the fact that larger samples lead to many more loci. And more loci basically tell you that a, a lot about the pathways and the processes. Okay? For example, for schizophrenia, people were not finding anything for a long, long time. And basically people just said, okay, great, it's not common variants. But, but now recognizing hundreds nowadays of loci associated with schizophrenia basically tells you that no, 
These are common variants in the population. It's just that it's hugely polygenic. So it tells you that it's a heritable and a medical disorder. It's not that you're possessed by demons. I mean, this, is, this is like how medical science used to be. Before you could actually find a genetic cause, you could say, oh yeah, he's faking it, or he's just, he had a huge uh, environmental episode, or it's TV, <laughs> or something. Um, whereas now we know that this is something that you're born with, something that you're inheriting, something that's a clear, defined, well-defined medical disorder. Um, and it tells you also about the genetic architecture of the trait. It tells you about how many loci there are and what is their effect size. And with more and more genes, you can actually start recognizing key pathways and key processes. Okay? So one of the things that we're finding is that calcium channels are repeatedly hit in schizophrenia. That there's many proteins that are interacting with this fragile X gene. That neuron organization is you know, a common theme that many brain enhancers are repeatedly uh, disrupted, okay? Yeah. So you're now getting to, uh, basically we're, we've been talking about two modes. One mode is Mendelian genetics and strong effects where you can say, yes, this person will have the disease. The other mode is we need to care, we need to find the pathways in order to develop therapeutics, et cetera, going after these pathways. For common variants, you're kind of here, you're at the pathway level, you're not at the individual level. For rare variants with strong effects, you're at the individual level where you can say, yes, this person will get the disease if they have that. For um, a small number of loci, you might still be able to say, yes, if you have this and that, you will get the disease, but if you have only this or only that, you will not get the disease. But most of the time, it's not combinatorial. It's really just additive, where you're adding more and more risk based on the number of disease alleles that you carry. Kind of like as I showed you in the example of AMD, the more mutations you have, the higher your risk. Um, does that answer your question? So it doesn't quite solve the question of who will have the disease and which of these variants are required because it's frankly additive. So there's no such thing as, yes, it is required. But for Alzheimer's, for example, you have a combination of the APOE locus that carries a huge amount of the heritability, roughly half of what you find in the entire rest of the genome. And you have a lot of common variants. In that particular case, it's, well, a combination of an almost yes, no answer and the overall polygenic risk. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? All right, <clears throat> so this is basically the GWAS catalog. This is a reference that was initially built by the NSGRI, now uh, combined with Ensemble, where you can basically see that there are 1,300 uh, GWAS results that are genome-wide significant across 221 traits as of 2011. As of 2018, we're looking at 70,000 associations. As of today, we're looking at 120,000 associations. This is really exponential growth. Uh, and we used to plot every single one of them on a piece of paper. Uh, now there's a program that lays them all out. Uh, so the, the field has basically come a huge way. Okay? So we can stop there and celebrate and basically say, great, we know all the loci. Or we could panic and say, we have no idea what they do. Okay, and that's what uh, section three is about. How do we now go about interpreting these loci? Okay, so the goal of GWAS was to inform on the biology of disease. So how do we get there? The challenge of interpretation is that most associations do not identify individual genes or causal variants. 93% of them are outside for the encoding regions. They're, they're only pointers to regions that have some causal influence on the disease. To develop and act on a therapeutic hypothesis, we must go much further. Number one, we need to figure out what genes are actually driving this. So in that locus, there might not even be a gene because the genetic region contains a regulatory element which might control a bunch of other genes far away. We saw in the example of AMD that there were two different genes that were exactly in that region but it might not be either of them. It might be something far away. What are the bi biological processes that are implicated? 
if we know the gene, we may know something about the process, but even finding the gene is a huge uh, problem. What is the cellular context in which it acts? I mean, genetic variants might act anywhere in the human body. If I have schizophrenia, it might be because that variant is affecting a neuron that only gets expressed when I go to college, or it might be affecting the microglial cell that is involved in the wiring of my brain, or it might be affecting, I don't know, a pancreatic cell that will basically tell me how I metabolize alcohol and you know, whether I like to drink or not, and that might have all kinds of other consequences. So the actual cell type that is implicated is very, very difficult to identify. And then lastly, what are the specific functional alleles that perturb the process and promote or protect the disease? So that's where we are. We basically have genome-wide association studies that basically give us great progress of disease mechanism, new target genes, new therapeutics, precision medicine, and we have the challenge of mechanism. In this particular case, I'm showing you the FTO locus. This is the strongest association with obesity. And if you look within it, there's no clear winner. All of these SNPs have roughly the same p-value. There's 89 common variants, and that's not uh, any, 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 uh, an exception. It's the norm. 90% of these hits are in fact non coded So we don't know the target gene, we don't know the causal variant, we don't know the cell type of action, we don't know the relevant pathways, and we don't know the mechanism. But the remedy is the stuff that we've talked about already. It's basically systematically understanding every single nucleotide of the human genome. Basically annotating the non-coding genome systematically across every cell type of the human body. There are trillions of cells. We need to understand, you know, 2.3 billion nucleotides in uh, <laughs> a few trillion cells, right? Great, let's go to it. Um, so it's a hard problem, but we are making great progress. Basically, number one, annotating this non-coding genome. Number two, linking these non-coding elements to their upstream regulators and to their target genes. Finding the intermediate molecular and cellular phenotypes, which we're going to talk about on Tuesday. And then delivering the relevant cell type, target gene, causal variant, upstream regulator, relevant pathways, and intermediate phenotypes. So we wrote a review paper in 2012 on GWAS dissection that basically I really encourage you to read. Interpreting non-coding genetic variation in complex traits in human disease. So this is Luke Ward, who has since gone to industry and done pretty awesome things. And um, within that paper, we basically fought, first talked about the different types of variation between classic monogenic traits, all the way to monogenic traits, all the way to uh, common variants, uh, you know, rare variants and private and somatic variants. We talk about the different uh, types of association. So basically for genome-wide association studies, you basically have cases and controls, and you look at relationship between the genotype and the uh, phenotype. Um, but you can also do that for quantitative traits, as we're gonna talk about on uh, Tuesday. And you also can look at allelic differences or simply when the molecular uh, biomarker correlates with the disease, but you don't have a genetic basis for that molecular biomarker. And then, of course, the different types of mechanisms. So it might be affecting a non coding uh, element, uh, such as splice junctions or uh, translation, stability, localization, uh, some transacting uh, regulatory RNA. Uh, the promoter, the enhancer, or even synonymous mutations within protein coding regions. So basically, all of these things should be on your mind. Don't just focus on enhancers, for example, which uh, you know a, a lot of different studies are focusing on, but basically there's a huge diversity of functions that could be implicated. And then uh, laying out the different types of evidence that can be utilized for interpretation. For example, you can have uh, genetic variants here, here, and here, some of which are falling in enhancers, for example, this one, and then you can link these enhancers to their target genes through these blue arrows, and you can basically say, well, this is a likely causal variant because it falls in a relevant enhancer, in a relevant cell type, and the relevant target gene might be this one. Everybody with me on this one? So you could also ask what, which ones perturb specific motifs. So you could basically say, what are the motifs that are altered and what tissues are these motifs acting in? So in this particular case, you have three variants again that are associated. Only the middle one is perturbing uh, this motif and it's causing loss of motif B. And motif B is acting in this particular tissue. So you can learn something about who might be the upstream regulator whose binding is disrupted and what might be the tissue where it's disrupted. 
Everybody with me in this one? And then a third approach might be to say, let's look at comparative genomics, so evolutionary conservation. We talked about this briefly in section one. We're going to talk about it again in the last module of the class, uh, where some of these genetic variants might be evolutionarily conserved, but not others. So again, looking at the same three variants, you find that the middle one happens to be in a region that is evolutionarily conserved across different species. If evolution cares about it, it's probably important. Okay, so these are different lines of evidence. Everybody with me? And then there's many different tools that allow you to do data integration. So RegulumDB, developed by Mike Snyder's group, Haploreg, developed by our group, and specifically Luke Ward, and then several other uh, tools for systematically intersecting these genetic variants across linkage statistical room blocks with uh, functional information, with diff information, so on and so forth. And then the last frontier is, of course, doing systems level analysis, where you can basically look across many different loci for what are the genes that are repeatedly hit by many different SNPs in this uh, region? Or what are all of the uh, lines of evidence that point to specific tissues by integrating multiple lines of evidence? For example, a new TTL in tissue one and an enhancer in tissue one might both be implicated in different loci. So there's convergence happening across different regions. Um, Allelic variation is another one where you can basically ask about differences in the specific uh, alleles that are expressed for each individual. And you can also uh, study that in the context of uh, whole genomes and their interpretation. So putting all these together, we can now systematically start tackling uh, you know, disease by building these resources and then using them to interpret uh, genome-wide association studies. We talked about epigenomics and how you can map the stromatin states. We talked about how you can build modules of enhancers that are coordinately active and use these modules to predict upstream regulators and to predict downstream target genes. You can then end up with the circuitry of every location in the genome and then ask for every GWAS variant, what are the enhancers that it overlaps? What are the tissues where these enhancers are active? Who are the upstream regulators that might be controlling these enhancers and therefore whose motifs might be disrupted? Who are the target genes that are correlated or co-localized or co-expressed with the activity of these enhancers in those cell types? Everybody with me? So what you can basically do is look at that in every individual locus and then gather information across many loci. So Hablareg is one example system. So this is the one that Luke and I built together uh, back in 2011. We've updated it many times since then to basically look at where, what are the common variants that are co-inherited with the associated variants and what are all of the types of annotations that they overlap across promoters, enhancers, evolutionary conserved elements, uh, DNA accessible regions, individual proteins that are binding there, individual motifs that are perturbed, and of course, uh, gene entries. Everybody with me? So you can then use that to say, what are the global enrichments with which I can now start interpreting that association? So if you look at height and you find all of the genetic associations with height, you can basically ask, how often do they overlap enhancers that are active in different tissues? In this particular case, the genetic variants associated with height preferentially hit enhancers that are active in stem cells. Genetic variants associated with type 1 diabetes preferentially hit enhancers that are active in immune cells. Genetic variants associated with blood pressure preferentially overlap enhancers that are active in heart. Genetic variants associated with cholesterol preferentially overlap enhancers active in liver. Is everybody with me as to what we're doing? We're basically taking genetic variants on one side, epigenomic annotations on the other side, and then asking if they overlap more than what you would expect by chance. And doing this, we've basically been able to paint a diagonal across different traits and different tissues, which basically tells us that we can pinpoint the tissues where different traits are active. Okay? So if you look at height, you find embryonic stem cells and pretty much nothing else. If you look at blood pressure, you basically find the left ventricle of the heart and pretty much nothing else. So you can start making predictions about what are the tissues where genetic variants are acting. If you'll find cholesterol, you basically mm -hmm. see liver. If you find glucose-related traits, you find 
pancreatic islands, which are again, the cells in your pancreas that are producing uh, insulin and therefore control the level of glucose in your blood. If you look at inflammatory disease, bowel disease, you basically find in immune and uh, digestive tissues. So this allowed us to now start gaining insights into the mechanism underlying disease. For Alzheimer's, we basically found a very big surprise. We were expecting to find an enrichment for Alzheimer's and brain, but we didn't. Instead, we found an enrichment for monocytes, which are the immune cells that are resident inside the brain. And our brain samples were predominantly neurons. And to a lower degree, astrocytes only because dendrocytes, whereas microglia are only five to 10% of these samples. So that basically allowed us to write a paper that says conserved epigenomic signal in mice and humans reveal the immune basis of Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's is now recognized to be primarily an immune disorder of the microglia to a great extent. So we can actually start laying out maps of what are the, the, the tissues where the different traits appear to be active. So that's at the global level. Next week, we're going to talk about how we can take these global enrichments and then map them down to individual loci to start understanding the mechanisms underlying these complex disorders. Okay. And in particular, the first example was that was work that we did jointly with Medina Klausen, sir, in uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this basically took this FTO locus that I mentioned to you, and we were able to point to pinpoint it down to a single driver nucleotide. We were able to sort of dissect the tissue where it acts, the target genes, the causal nucleotides, the upstream regulators, the cellular phenotypes, and the organismal phenotypes, effectively showing that GWAS works. And sort of bringing all of these different lines of evidence that uh, together of the epigenomic information to pinpoint the cell type, the high C linking information to find the target genes, the QTL information that we're gonna talk about on Tuesday to pinpoint which are the genes that change in expression in the risk individuals, the motif information to pinpoint the driver nucleotide, the transacting factor information to find the upstream regulator, and the cellular and the organismal phenotypes to infer the mechanism of action. Okay, I like to say that this is a whole paper written about one bit of information, about one SNP in the human genome, RS142189. So it's a fun field, it's an incredible time to be in it, and we can do amazing things with it. So we talked about Mendelian genetics, we talked about complex genetics, we saw how we can build the GWAS and how we can start interpreting both individual loci and global signals. Who feels that they've learned stuff? Yay. All right, thank you guys. See you next week and see you tomorrow.